Thanks for tuning in. Join me today as I show you my three Nakamichi digital products, the 1000P, the 1000MB, and the 1000 DAT deck. If you enjoy vintage audio equipment, you've come to the right spot. Please subscribe and hit that notification bell, as well as giving me a big thumbs up if you like this video and share it with others. There is a risk of serious injury or death from electrical shock working on this equipment. If you're not comfortable with working on the equipment, please do not take the cover off and consult a professional. First, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the three different units. In addition, there are two separate remotes also. So really there's five separate units that I'll be talking about in this video. They were all built by Nakamichi in the late 1980s into the 1990s. It was pretty much Nakamichi's last gasp. By the late 1980s, Nakamichi was barely hanging on. Hard to imagine, isn't it? You know, I mean, they were so dominant in the cassette tape market, but things change and things were going digital. They're unbelievably built. All three of them are all copper-plated chassis, all steel and aluminum, thick, heavy. You wouldn't believe it if you if you grabbed one of these. The the quality of them. They each weigh they they vary a little bit, but they're in the thirty to forty pound range each, and they just couldn't be built any better. And they were extremely expensive in the day. Um, from my understanding, there were only about fifty dealers in the United States. And I can't even confirm that. There weren't very many, and these three units were going to run you over $10,000 in the late 80s. So they were very expensive. The 1000P is an analog to digital and a digital to analog converter. Big and heavy, and this is the late 1980s. Right, for most of you vintage guys, this is when everything was was going downhill. And these are built every bit as well or better than the earlier audio equipment. Now the 1000 MB, it's capable of holding up to seven CDs. It's a CD changer. And again, in, in this unit's case, just as heavy. It does not have any type of a digital to analog converter built in it. So this is why you need the 1000 P to be able to convert those digital signals into analog so you, so you can listen to it. So if you have a 1000 MB CD changer, you can't use it without a digital to analog converter. And lastly is the 1000 digital audio tape transport. And once again, this unit does not have any type of a digital to analog converter built in it. You have to hook it to a DAC. And in this case, this was an entire system. So this is why you needed the 1000P along with the 1000MB if you wanted CD uh, CDs in your system and also the 1000 DAT tape deck if you wanted to have the whole system. And as I said, it was um, more than $11,000. I'm sh gonna show you later on how fast this DAT deck loads and unloads. They had a system called FAST, standing for Fast Access Stationary Tape Guide Transport. It, it loads and unloads in a couple seconds, where a normal DAT deck you know, takes four seconds, five, six, seven, whatever. But this is noticeably faster of, of how quick it loads. And again, the 1000 DAT built like a tank. Incredible. And I'm also later on going to show you the remotes. And I say remotes, there wasn't one remote for this system. There were two separate ones. One for the 1000 MB CD changer and one for the 1000 DAT unit. Big remotes. I mean, big by today's standards. I mean, these are big and heavy. These are two, three pounds a piece and very large. They'll take up a large section of your table. So I'm going to show those later, but I just wanted to give you a little background on them. Uh, I, I received two of these at the same time. 
the 1000P I got along with the 1000MB. The DAT deck I got later on and it had an issue that I'm gonna go through here later and then tell you what I did with it. I'm gonna show you the insides and the outsides of all three units and um, the issues I had with them. The Nakan Michi 1000 DAT, uh, this, this one needs some repairs. Uh, put a tape in it, it seemed to load up okay, and um, but you had a lot of distortion in the playback. I did notice if you played with the fast forward, the rewind, you know, just hit the buttons real quick, play, stop. Um, the distortion at times almost go away, at other times it'd be real bad, so that kind of gave me a clue that maybe there's something to do with the tape path. Stop it and move the tape a little bit and it'd work kind of and, and then it'd get worse so anyway it kind of gave me a little clue before I got started what I might be getting into man is this thing built <laughs> thick aluminum I mean it's uh, I think it, it's up to three sixteenths of an inch thick a solid copper uh, plate uh, used throughout I mean I can see why it was several thousand dollars new I mean even in the late 80s I mean it, it, it's a just a gorgeous piece of equipment really it would rival you know, any of the new stuff today. I mean, it, it just would. The attention to detail, outstanding for a consumer product um, back then or, or today. So um, I've removed the uh, top covers and the bottom covers just to, just to take a look. What am I getting into here? You know, one thing I noticed, like the power supply sits at the bottom and um, like all the assemblies, um, it has a modular plug-in uh, connectors. They're used throughout, so really, to get this stuff in and out um, is pretty simple. This, I think, had six screws, and um, just pull the connectors, and out she'll come. And, uh, and the other boards were like that, too. They're plug-in connectors, and they, they come in easily. There's no point-to-point -point wiring. Everything's in a modular uh, plug-in connector scheme. As I said, I had this distortion issue. You, you know, the rest of the deck, it seemed to fast-forward and, and rewind somewhat, and I could put it into um, record mode. Um, and then playback mode. So, but anyway, I, I, I took the faceplate off just so I could get a better look at the drive unit. And so that's what I've done here. And you can load a tape and actually see how it's loading. So you just, you know, it's right there in your face. It's impossible to see this with the, uh, with the faceplate on and the thing together, but this, this might help me figure out you know what's going on here this deck like every other first thing you do is just clean up the tape path I mean you do that and you've got a good chance of a deck working and in, in this case that didn't help but I still needed to do it I removed the entire drive you know out of the unit again this was pretty easy um, you know there's just there's uh, I think there was four screws holding the drive unit then there were the modular uh, connector cables and those just pulled right off the various boards in the unit and um, that wasn't a big deal just so I could take a closer just take a closer look at it you know like always like any equipment though before you start removing cables out of anything take a picture great in the digital world that you can take thousands of them and uh, doesn't cost you a dime and if there's some question down the road how these things go back together uh, you've got a picture while I was in there I did notice there was an assembly that was attached to the uh, drive unit itself it had some electrolytic capacitors on it, and I didn't really think this was going to fix it, but if I ever got this thing going, um, I wasn't going to take it back apart to do that. So there were, I don't know what there were, eight maybe, something like that, electrolytics on it. There might have been three, maybe five electrolytics and three nonpolars. Anyway, you know, while I had it apart, I thought, you know, why not take, uh, take a few minutes and really a couple dollars, and why not change them out? I mean, they're still 30 years old and uh, I didn't think this was going to fix my problem but why not do it while while I was in there and of course I did put it back together and uh, still had the distortion problem but anyway like I said it was uh, worth a few minutes and a couple bucks you know the RF assembly I, I took that off I didn't know what I was going to do if, if it was the RF assembly because uh, I didn't have like uh, I wish I'd worked in the factory and I could just borrow another one out of the bin but I, I took it off to uh, to take a look at it to see if I could just see anything obvious I didn't but uh, again it was a couple screws a couple cables 
and right out it came. One thing I could not find for this unit, which uh, I, I can't say about any other unit, I, I could not find a service manual anywhere on the internet for this. I've, I, I, I mean, I, I didn't care if I had to pay for it. I didn't care what the deal was, but there's so few of these made. I'm sure there's some in the world, and if anybody's listening to this that has a service manual for uh, a Nakamichi uh, DAT unit, please contact me, and I'd, I'd you know, be willing to pay you for a copy or pay you if you e email me a copy of it, because without a service manual, it makes it very difficult to work on uh, any piece of equipment. What I ended up doing was setting up a small table in front of my workbench so I could hook, hook the faceplate up so I could use all the controls and get a better look again at what the, what the drive unit was doing with the tape. As I said, I thought I had some sort of a tape issue, um, more so than an electronic issue. I mean, I wasn't really sure of that, but just the way it was uh, acting. With the faceplate on there and extended out, I could, you know, load and unload the tape, hit the play button, rewind, and just see what the tape was doing. What I noticed was, you know, working, I, I've only worked on a, a few DAT decks. I've never, you know, these are similar to VCRs. I've never been big into VCRs, so I didn't work much on them, but I have worked on a pretty good number of cassette and, and open reel decks and just by l watching the tape and the way it was acting it just appeared the tape tension was questionable at least in my mind it, it just didn't handle the t you know between the modes sometimes it looks like you had a little slack and, and on these things it don't take much you know if you can see it if I can see something that's questionable with my eyeball, it, it, it's, it's probably an issue. I took a good look at the tape path. I couldn't see anything obvious. Um, as I said, I cleaned it up real well. I took off the pinch roller. You know, once again, take it off, clean it up. I mean, tried to make everything as new to make sure it wasn't sort of a tape some sort of a tape path issue and I mean you know just from lack of having you know crap on it so I uh, you know again I cleaned it up as well as I could and of course put everything back together and um, again I still had the uh, I still had the distortion but as I said after some I, I didn't again I didn't have the service manual and you really shouldn't work on stuff if you don't have a service manual but I couldn't find one <laughs> so you know it wasn't the best option to just fumble around with this thing blindly but um, it was my only option for this deck so after just just from experience with other decks I, I, I could tell something was up with what I thought was the tape tension. Something was up with it. And what I ended up doing, and then again, these things are so, it's so critical. It's nuts to really be in here without the proper uh, calibration tape and, you know, using the proper equipment to do this. But what I ended up doing uh, was adjusting the back tension adjustment screw just slightly. And again, over time, you know, these things over 30 years, you know, loading, unloading, playing, fast forwarding, it don't take much. And so I about a half a turn, I tightened up just, just the back tension adjustment screw just a hair. But what do you know? The thing actually... Uh, would play without distortion. And this was a tape, of course, not recorded on this machine. It was my other DAT deck. And so I did a little bit of experimenting. Like any tape deck, one of the big things, um, again, this isn't, you know, you, you should use the proper service manual, the proper calibration tape, and the proper equipment to set any tape deck up. But I did do some recording on this DAT. I also have another DAT, I have a Fostex um, uh, D15. I did some recording on this deck and I played it back on the on the Nakamichi and it sounded good, but then I went over to the Fostex, which also has an error counter. Um, this DAT, the Nakamichi doesn't, but the Fostex does, and really it, 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 it played as well with as few errors as one of the tapes that were taped off my Fostex D15. So, and also, as I said, I, I played some that were recording on that in the Nakamichi and they all sounded really good. So I think I got the back tension pretty close. Is, is it is it 
the way I like to do things? No. <laughs> but um, again, in, in, in this deck's case, I just had no other choice. So I uh, hooked it up. Uh, I got everything back together. You know, I put the case back on once I felt comfortable it was working. I've got the 1000 DAT going. So now we're going to move over to the 1000 MB CD changer. When I first put the 1000 M MB up on the test bench, I took a look at it like I do with all the vi vintage equipment that I receive. And right off the bat, I could see the eject load button as well as the power button were misaligned and kind of loose. I could just see the misalignment with my eyes and then when I touched it, it didn't feel quite right. So like I always do though, I, I removed the top cover and just took a look at the unit, making sure I was gonna get no surprises. Did the same with the bottom. Took the bottom cover off just to take a look. On this one, to get to the uh, eject load and power switch buttons, I was going to have to take off a side cover also. So I went ahead and did that. This picture shows the unit on its side. And when I took the cover off and I was able to get to where the uh, eject and the power buttons are, in this picture I sh I'm pulling this little board out a little bit with my thumb and finger. There was adhesive that was there's some glue that had broke loose from this little plastic plate here that's just you can see a little bit of space there to the aluminum case and so i just put a little bit of adhesive back in there i put it back in and it was perfect solid as a rock just over the years or got jarred or, or whatever i just uh put the adhesive on it and put it right back in and everything was fine. So what I did, I reinstalled the side panel cover after I repaired that. I wasn't going to need to get in there, I didn't think, so I put that back on and the uh, you know the the buttons now they felt, you know, they felt secure and they were nice and straight. So I felt that was all fixed. So I moved on and I powered it up. You know, I had the top cover off, but I went ahead and I powered uh, powered it up, and it powered up fine, and I just did a little bit of testing with it. As uh, I mentioned earlier, it's a seven disc changer, so you get a pretty good view of it here with the top off. You can see how it actually operates. And as I mentioned before also, the uh, 1000 MB comes with a remote control. Now it's, I show a picture here, it's sitting on the top. When the top cover was on it, it's sitting there. Look at the width of that thing. It's big. You know, it's, it's a big remote. It's not tiny. And this remote only controlled one unit, and it's uh, the Nakamichi 1000 MB. So everything was good. I put it back together. Uh, there was no issues. You know, it, it tested fine on the test bench. I put some CDs in it and it seemed to work fine, would change between discs fine. So I put it all back together. You know, I was done with her for now. So uh, I think I've got the uh, 1000 MB all straightened out and now I'll move on to the 1000 P. So I moved in the 1000 P, which as I had mentioned earlier, I received when I got the 1000 uh, MB CD changer. So I purchased those together and now it was time to get the uh, 1000 P up on the test bench and see what I had. And once again, like with all equipment, uh, take the covers off. Take Just take a look. I, I didn't know who'd been messing with it, if it had been messed with it at all. So it's always best to take a look. But once again, the, I, I know I mentioned this over and over, but if you ever see one of these, you're going to think, holy smokes. I, I, I don't know any other, even high-end equipment today is built like this. It's incredible. Three, three sixteenths of an inch thick uh, aluminum chassis and just heavy copper plating throughout the whole the whole unit um, it's just really incredible the workmanship and the attention to detail of this nakamichi 1000p would rival any high-end stereo equipment of today this particular unit the 1000p nakamichi cost six thousand dollars in 1989 
That's a lot of coin in 1989. A lot of coin now, right? This was high-end stuff, very, very expensive and exclusive. It had the future in mind. All assemblies are plug-in, have plug-in connectors for easy removal. So you can pull a whole card out of this unit. Technology's changed and you can just plug in a new board and keep on going for a few more years. It didn't work out that way for them, but it, it's really a beautiful design. You know, here, I haven't showed the bottom yet of any of these, but look look at the bottom of these. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's where the power supply is accessed and I, I mean, they're just gorgeous. They're just beautiful, beautiful units. With the covers removed, you can now see the artwork side of one of the assemblies and you can almost see the connector at the front. That unplugs. You undo two screws in the back and that whole board pulls straight out the back. And you can see the power supply down below. Everything is easy to get at. Here in this picture, you can see the back panel and you can see a couple screws. There's actually three cards in this if you look to the left. And if you're to undo those two screws on the far side and just pull, the whole assembly comes right out in your hand. There's both balanced and unbalanced connectors. Uh, whichever you'd like to use. The front panel of the 1000P, it has some little LEDs that shows the uh, bit rate, little bit rate indicators, uh, the meters, source record, and output level controls are included. I didn't find any issues on the test bench. Uh, it seemed fine. I cleaned it up a little bit. I reinstalled the covers. Everything sounded good. I used it with my uh, with my uh, 1000 MB. I kind of tested them together, and it worked fine. Sounded good. So um, I think we're done here. So this unit really didn't have anything that I really saw other than to take it apart and to be impressed with the workmanship of this unit. Just, just, it's just spectacular. It really is. So, all right, I'm all set. I'm all done with the Nakamichi 1000P, and we'll move on and put them all together and make a system out of them and let them make some music. I did want to mention the two remotes. The CD changer remote, the 1000 MB's remote, and also the 1000 DAT DEX remote. They're about 12 inches long, about five inches wide. They weigh a couple pounds. They just run the one, the one particular machine. So your table would be pretty filled up, uh, quite a bit different from modern remotes, but they're built every bit as well as the units are. So they're really high quality. They've, again, they've lasted all these years, just like these units have. So I just wanted to mention a little bit about them, show those a little bit, and think about what it was like to have that back 30 years ago and trying to use those big remotes with this spectacular equipment. The sound of these three units is outstanding. Is it up to today's standards? Well, I'll leave you guys out there to decide about that. It's like a, it's like a 30 year old vintage car. Are they as good as today's cars? Some people would say yes, some would say no, and I'm going to leave that up to you. But I will say, using the system together, it sounds great. The DAT deck works great. As I mentioned earlier, I, I have another DAT deck, a Fostex, and with an error counter in it. And the tapes, you can't tell. You can't tell which deck made them, which deck recorded them, or which deck is playing them back. They sound identical. The CD changer, it works great, and it's a pretty complicated one at that, but it works very, very well. And again, I like to compare it to old cars. Is a 30-year-old car as technologically advanced as a modern car? No, but a lot of them are pretty cool when they're operating properly, and I'll say that about the 1000 MB. The 1000P, it sounds great, it works great. Now in today's world, a single chip would have the power of this entire unit. But that's again, that's technology. And is it up to snuff with today's technology? Maybe not. And again, I like to compare it to a vintage car. It really does sound good. The entire group of components look great, they're built forever and they sound good 
and when operating properly like these are they can they can stay that they're not gonna you know they're not gonna compete with anything modern in in the modern digital world these three units but they are just so cool and they're so fun to play with and I'll say it one more time the build quality is spectacular you'll be real hard-pressed to find any consumer piece of equipment that's built like this so I hope you enjoyed this video. I certainly enjoyed putting it together for you guys. And if you did enjoy it, please give me a big thumbs up down below. Please leave your comments down below too. I read all of those. For you non-subscribers, if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe. And for my present subscribers, as always, thank you so much. You all have a good day.